So today we talk about WLAN management and architectures. How are we going to manage the wireless network? How do you want to manage the wireless network? If we have, and we'll go through these things, I'm going to use some, some of the terms that we're going to talk about here in a minute, look at the pictures of them, but autonomous wireless access points. When we say autonomous, that's what you and I have at home. We go in and do the configuration. That's what that one sitting in the back is. It's an autonomous access point. You connect to it. You put in what kind of security you want. You can pick the speeds that you want. In this one, in these, you can pick what you want it to be. Do you want it to be an access point? Do you want it to be a bridge? So you can create a wireless bridge with those things. What do you want to do with it? The issue with the, with the autonomous access points is, what well, if you got 50 of them? And you got to make a change. Then you got to get all 50 of them. I guess it'd be good money for a while, huh? Because by the time it, it, you guys would probably, by the time you got to the second one, by the time I got to the 40th or 41st one, I'd probably be pretty good at doing the configuration and not make a lot of mistakes. But it takes a lot of time, a lot of maintenance required there. And that's where we get into this lightweight access point. And what's kind of always been interesting to me in the Cisco world, when you upgrade an autonomous access point, it becomes a lightweight access point. Lightweight access point has no configuration. You can't do anything with it. You don't configure it separately. It's configured centrally, and that's where the architecture gets into them. Well, that's what we'll talk about in a little bit, the, what's called the WLAN controller, the wireless local area network controller, which sends all the configuration information to the access point. It's kind of like Active Directory, isn't it? We could go in, if we had 100 computers and we didn't have them in an Active Directory, we'd have to manage each of those computers individually. If we wanted to manage them centrally, we install Active Directory, join the machines to Active Directory, and central, centrally manage those things. So centralized management. The other we talked about is the uh, ad hoc mode, the independent, independent, which you're probably not going to, hopefully at least, not going to use a whole lot in, in a uh, corporate environment, in an enterprise environment. So the objective describes the functions of an autonomous access point architecture. Kind of been there, done that. There's a couple of things that we can do with, with those, and then we're going to talk about VLANs and SSIDs. And these access points back there, my net gear, I can't put but one SSID on it. These back here, you can do more. And I think some of them say they go up to like 16 SSIDs. You see that here in the building, don't you? Because when you look at the wireless, you'd see two SSIDs, SkyCart and SkyNet. What's the difference? One of them's got security on them, one doesn't got security on them. One of them is for us, the other one's for corporate machines. They all run on the same piece of hardware. If you look at them, and when you can see before you actually get connected to one of those things, the uh, signal strength for them on the channels that they're on are the same. And they are the different ones are on the on different access points are on the same channel. So they are there. There's multiple SSIDs that run on those things. The characteristics and features of a controller-based architecture is controller-based architecture, the lightweight access point, the one that has no intelligence, and that's the term that they use, whether it's intelligence. And it's kind of like switches. We have managed switches and unmanaged switches. Unmanaged switch, we can't do anything to it like put port security on it. A managed switch, we can do things too. We can we can make it a trunk port. We can make it an access port. We can put port security on it. Those kinds of things. An autonomous access point is like a managed switch, it, and it has the switching capability, the management capability in it. A lightweight access point is like an unmanaged switch except we do kind of manage it. We don't kind of manage it. We do manage it, but not individually. We manage it back to the Active Directory analogy. We centrally manage those things. The difference between multiple and single channel architecture, and here's the one that kind of, we said all along that these channels got to be separated by, what, 5, 1, 6, and 11. And now what we're going to say is, well, sometimes. 
multiple channel architecture is we do separate them by five so that we don't do the interference. The single channel architecture is everything's on the same channel, which is kind of weird because you get interference. You do stick, you do get interference, and it's based on the theory that, and and this is seems to be kind of inverted, con, con, inverted. I can't say the other word. Inverted to me in that the Interference goes further than the signal does, but we can still be able to, and, and we can discriminate the signal because it's going to be stronger than the interference, and that's what you're really talking about there, that it can overcome it. So you can use a single channel. That's one of the architectures. What you got to do if you set up these things, and again, we're talking about more than this building, although this building's got four access points in it. And it uses multi-channel architecture. And you can see that as you, if when you do the scans on it, you've got SkyCart, SkyNet, and different locations in the building, channels 1, 6, and 11. And then there's another one. I think that they use one twice, one in the front and one in the back, to get, them, to get as much separation as possible from those two channels. So we can put all of them on the same channel if you want. What you would probably do is in an area put them all in the same channel, and in another area pick another channel that we want to do this with. What a wireless network management system is and how it functions, and this is going to be the, the wireless LAN controller. I thought it would be really neat to buy one of those for this class, and it would be really neat, except they cost about eight to $10,000. So we don't have one. Uh, the, the, the access points in the building are actually managed centrally, and we're going to talk about, refer to, and and, and Everything's cloud stuff, right? Cloud's great. If you can say cloud anything, then people just, you know, oh, golly, that's wonderful. So cloud management of access points. All cloud management means is what? You're using the Internet. And the access points in here are managed externally via the Internet, so it's cloud management. Somebody someplace else gets access to them and manages them. The Actually, the heating system in here can be cloud managed because it can manage it from the internet. It has it has a web interface to manage the temperature control the temperatures in the rooms. That's why we can't and they can. Characteristics of basic and enhanced power management technologies. And one of the null or actually probably all of the null packets that you see in the scan that you did probably has a power management or may have a, I don't want to say probably, well, probably has a power management. Power management is one of those frames that you send when the laptop, the tablet, the telephone, or whatever is going to go to sleep. And they go to sleep to conserve the battery. And you really want those NICs to go to sleep because one of the big power consumers, battery consumers, is going to be the radio that runs the wireless NIC. One of the things that I have discovered with my little tablets with my Nook is if I turn, if I'm not using the internet, if I turn the internet off, turn the radio off, battery does last quite a bit longer. Same thing on your in your laptop. If you're not using the wireless, turn turn the wireless off, the battery's going to last longer because it's not having to send, it's not having to run that transceiver, transmitter receiver that it has and, and all the access points are. This is I found this in another book. I just thought this was kind of an interesting evolution of what goes on here. And this evolution is, this talks about at, at, at the beginning intelligent edge architecture. Intelligent edge architecture, it sets at the edge of your network. And it's anonymous access points. What it had was scalability. Then we move into semi-scalability, and that's the management of autonomous access points because semi-scalability once you get above, and I've seen a number that says like 25, it be they become kind of unwieldy. You don't really want to make that many changes to, to them. The WLAN Network Management Systems, WNMS here, central management WLAN controllers with lightweight access points. When they get larger, they become much more scalable then. Distributed multiple services, multiple WLAN controllers, and hybrid access points. So what the multiple services, the multiple WLANs, we have to have 
something to manage our wireless LAN controllers. So we're managing them centrally. And then unified WLAN architecture, and this is a Cisco. When we see unified, when you see that term, you're probably going to think Cisco because that's their term for a lot of stuff, is unified management, managing everything. Seamless wireless services, unified switch and controller infrastructure so that everything is being managed centrally. Not only you're managing your access points, but you're managing your other devices also. Most common architecture is a standalone access point. Before Skyline, which was at the time ECPI hired, or actually corporate hired, and I think it's Cox actually manages the wireless, hired them to do all of the campuses this is exactly what we had, a standalone access point. Kind of a pain. Put it in the NOC for a while. Didn't get coverage. Put it in the library. It kind of worked and it kind of didn't work. And it would work in some areas and not work in some areas. And if you go over there and look where it was physically installed, yeah, there's some stuff in the way. And then they set it on that big blue box over there. You know what that big blue box is? A power conditioner. So, no, we didn't get any interference there. What was kind of interesting, we used to have CRTs. I digress. We used to have CRTs. We had a computer sitting there, and you'd get these nice wavy picture on the screen and tell you, unless you got the, the monitor turned in the right direction so that you could actually see that, yes, there really are electromagnetic waves coming from that. So the standalone, the single access point, that's what you have at home. It's what I have at home. It's probably what you have at home. The other thing that he could do, and this is going to be, when we talk about this, the standalones the, in, their, in their term is the, is the BSS, right? Not an ESS, but a BSS, the basic. So we're going to have one that has a, has a coverage area. Also known as autonomous access points. This is just a way to, this is a way so that I can let you have a lot of, uh, I didn't make these up, but to let you have a lot of, uh, you know, words in the in the uh, crossword puzzles, right? I didn't make these up. These are all terms that you're going to see for these things. So, standalone is an autonomous access point, and autonomous just means that it is self-contained, doesn't it? An autonomous anything. All the intelligence, the quote intelligence, and this is what I was talking about earlier, for the wireless management, authentication and encryption is contained within the access point. So, the management's in there. Do we do encryption of these things? Yeah, we, we hope we do. We don't have to do that. All of that is authentication, encryption, authentication, association, all of that stuff is within the wireless access point itself. And that's what makes it autonomous. Also called FAT access points. So we've got three terms on this page that these things are called. Standalone, autonomous, or fat access points, and the lightweight are also going to be called thin access points. They don't call them unautonomous. Architectures include a network connectivity with lots of features. And when you look at these things and you did the activity to look at access points, they all got different features when you look at them. And generally, the more expensive ones got more features. So. More features, more expensive as we go through this thing. And what do you need to do with it? At home, what do you need to do with one? I need to connect to the Internet. In a business, what do you need to do? You may, you may need to have multiple SSIDs. You may need it to support VLANs. So that's why what are the features, what can you do with any of these. And again, we're in the autonomous access point. Now, autonomous means that we're managing it one at a time. It's kind of like the, I guess the Texas Tavern seats, what, 250 people, five at a time or whatever it is down there that they got their size. It's more than five at a time, but, you know. I thought it was 1,000 and 10. 1,000 and 10, 10 at a time? Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> serving 1,000 people 10 at a time. Autonomous access points, serving all, but we're doing it one at a time. The network connectivity depends upon the type of the service set. And we've seen this. This is what we did the last time, the three service sets. So we'll review that. The BSS, basic service set, the extended service set, and the independent basic service set. All great, great terms, right? 
BSS means we have like one access point and one service area. Now, see, they're all direct, they're all connected except for the IBSS. The independent is the is the is connecting just computers together. And if you do a sharing, the BSS and the ESS all connect to the wired. The one that's not going to connect to the wired except for one is going to be the mesh. You eventually do you have to have it connected to the wired network? No, not if you don't want it to do anything. I mean, and that's an unfair. That's an unfair characterization. What if everything was contained within the wireless network? What if you had figured out how to put a wireless NIC into a server and you didn't want people on the Internet? Then you wouldn't have to be on, connected to the wire. But, but typically, you're going to do that. And what most of them are designed for is to get the wireless clients onto the wired network. I mean, that's what we do, not the wired network that you necessarily want to be on, because when you go on the wireless, here you get on the wired network, and the wired network takes you directly to the Internet. So, and they have modified it. They took some of the restrictions off. It will take you to the virtual server server now also, so that if you want to work on your laptops when we get into get into into those again if you guys are about done so you probably won't but you can act you should be able to get to the to them via the wireless now and the the, uh, the thing that is an issue that the network administrator who's in the night class found out when he was trying to do those certification questions the other night all those pictures are stored on Ranger. Now he couldn't see the pictures on his laptop, so he said he would see if they could fix that too. But get to the wired network. Typically, what's going to be the extended service set? You have multiple. Okay, yeah, we say multiple BSSs. And we would plug in, and that's what Roger Farmer did eventually to try to solve our problem with a single access point. You could cover most of the building, but there were areas that you just didn't get to because of the different obstructions around in the building. And we'll look at that, have you guys look at that next week when we do talk about site surveys. What he did was take multiple access points, named them all the SSID, and plugged them into the wired network at different points. So that's what you're really doing when you're doing an extended service set on it. You just have multiple access points. You can have roaming. Roaming is a good deal. Roaming has a handoff. And when we get into the WLAN, the WLAN with the lightweight access point makes it a little smoother because you, you, you're going to do all of the security with the wireless LAN controller, not with the access point itself. And I've got a list that I want to try to put on the board for what those things do. So the ESS just as Dante said, composed of two or more BSS. We just have multiples of these things. So the distributed architecture, multiple access points form a non-centralized network through a wireless connection. That goes back to what if we're managing these things one at a time and we have 50 of them? And you got to change something. You've got to do all 50 of them, which could take some time. And we say that, it's like, oh, i got to pick up, pick up my stuff and go do that. Well, yeah. do you really? Can you manage them from a central location? It's not central management, but can you manage them from a central location? Probably because you're going to have IP addresses on all these things, and you should be able to get there through that interface because you have to connect to it some way. And most of them are managed through a GUI on the access point, right? A web page, basically, that manages those things. And most of the web pages are Java-driven. And one of the... Other things, and these are kind of back, you know, back to my random thoughts that happens. And they were talking about a guy who works at Korea and said, "Yeah, we have some issues with a lot of Cisco stuff has some really old versions of Java, and the new versions of Java won't drive them. You've got to go find the right version. If you run into those situations, that's one thing you really need to document because you're going to go away from that thing and come back in 18 months or two years, and it still doesn't work because you." have a tough time updating the Java on the on the uh, routers and you got to go rediscover which version works and the same version doesn't work for all of them. I've gone through some of those things. 
spent hours and cleverly didn't document it, spent hours figuring out which Java version would actually drive the interface for the uh, for the router. So when that happens to you and you find the version, document it, write it down someplace so that you can get back to it. Because there are some that you really do have to go back to. Feature sets. And it says many are designed to enhance configuration, installation, and management of the AP. What are we talking about feature sets? What can we get with a feature set? I'm going to pick on Trevor. What kind of features does the uh, 1200 have? Some of the features that it has. Uh, the bridge. The bridge? And, can make uh, a bridge out of it. Multiple, uh, multiple SSIDs. Yeah. VLANs. Yeah. We can create VLANs. And the advantage there with VLANs is we can put uh, the SSID, we can put the student SSID on the student VLAN. We can put the guest SSID on the guest VLAN. It only goes to the Internet. We don't want them on our network. We can put the accounting SSID on the accounting VLAN. So all of those things. You can make it a repeater, too. Exactly. Yeah, and that, that's one of the other things, the, the feature that it has. When you do those things like the bridge and the repeater, that means that they talk to each other wirelessly. That's going to be one of the features. My Netgear doesn't do that. And if you do that, do they all be on the same challenges? That you'd have to look at the access point. I think the answer is there is maybe, uh, but probably because it's just like tuning anything else. You've got to fine tune it. If you're not on the same channel, you've got to find the same channel. And the reason I hesitated there, you remember in the ends we have multiple radios, multiple radio channels, so that may or may not be the case there. But yeah, on the same channel so that they can communicate with each other, they got to be able to reach each other both ways, and we got these yogis that we're going to try to get the adapters for so that we can demonstrate the bridge at distance. And we can also then demonstrate the Fresnel effect, right? Because if we got them too low, if we don't have it right based on our distance, it's not going to go anywhere because we're going to be, we could be just based on the height of the antenna. In the building here going a short distance, we could be disturbing the 60%. We could have not have the 60% of the Fresnel zone clear. So all of those things are available. Typical features, 5 gigahertz. And one of the, I guess, advantage, well, 5 gigahertz does have advantages. People come in with 5 gigahertz radios, then you have the, you can work on both frequencies. The other 5 gigahertz here would be in a mesh environment. You can use the 5 gigahertz frequency for the access points to talk to each other and the 2.4 gigahertz for the clients to connect because most of us don't have 5 gigahertz radios in our computers, do we? Do you? Remember, N standard is backward compatible to the 5, to the five gigahertz. And when you look at, and these are in mix in these machines, and if when you look at, uh, what is it, the e ESSID, the, the one scanner, shows you some 5 gigahertz frequencies because we're using in access points now in the building. So you, you see all of those different frequencies that are available. Built-in security and manageability features. What kind of security? What do you have? My old Netgear, and I keep going back to it because it is old, goes all the way up to WPA. Is that necessarily a good thing? No. No, WPA2, oh, is that the one that, that needs certificates? WPA is basically upgraded WEP. It's WEP with TKIP, temporal key, which means that it gets a different key for everyone. It's better than WEP, but it's not nearly as good as WPA2. WPA2 is AES. And WPA2 Enterprise, and you've got WPA2 Personal, WPA2 Enterprise, you've got WPA personal and WPA enterprise. Mine doesn't have the enterprise part. But what the enterprise allows you to do is use the extensible authentication protocols, the 802.1x. And that's the one but that's the one that does require certificates. Allows you to use Active Directory for authenticating. That would kind of be a good thing to do. 
that somebody comes in, you got to put in a username and password to actually get onto the network. What 802.1x does, you can't get an IP address. DHCP doesn't work. Communication doesn't work, except for the EAP packets until you get authenticated. You can use that also on a physical switch. You can you can put it on a physical switch, turn the ports off. Anybody plugs in until they actually get authenticated, they don't get an IP address. You can do that with Active Directory. We can make a group of computers, these machines, put it in Active Directory and use EAP, the group we would use, we would authenticate the computers instead of the individuals. So there's lots of flexibility that you can use in these things. We have an external antenna connection. We've seen that, and as we've seen with these Yagis, you need to be careful of what size you get because the Cisco ones are bigger, and these guys have got the, th these are, these are which, the little ones? RP, SMA, RP is reverse polarity, you found out. So RP, SMA, and I think in the test bank you'll get, they ask you like one of the questions. And the big one is, he forgot already, TNC, RPTNC. You would never think that connectors could be such a pain until you get one that doesn't plug into what you got. Now you've got to figure out how to get it there. And what does what when. And these are really weird because they kind of name male and female. I think backwards, just looking at this is this is the male connector, it doesn't have a pin. Ever seen that before? Because no. <laughs> it goes to the male connector is real I think what they're really saying. Reverse polarity. That, that's yeah, that's yeah. that's part of the RP, the reverse polarity. So you gotta be careful about those things. All that stuff that we kinda talked about cables and connectors in, in networking one. All that stuff really does come back at times. Support a wireless distribution system. What the heck's a wireless distribution system? Could be like a mesh. Could be like a mesh. How about does a, does an autonomous access point have a wireless distribution system? Does it distribute the signal? Does it distribute it? Depends on. Bridge. What if I just plug stuff in? What if I just go from 802.11 to 802.3? Yeah. I, mean, I was thinking. Yeah, I know. I know you're thinking of wider, wider area, but wireless distribution system. Support a large number of wireless stations, and large is is in the eye of the beholder here. Large number is going to depend on what people are doing. If you're in a dorm, college dorm, and kids are watching TV and movies and things like that, a large number may be 10 to 15. If you're in an area that people aren't doing a whole lot of, just doing just, just a little you know, web surfing kind of thing, and those, those don't take very long, then you may be able to do 20 to 30. A number that I have seen that a lot of people, a lot of companies shoot for is about 15 connections per access point. Well, it doesn't sound like a whole lot. It really doesn't sound like a whole lot. But if you don't have to do all of that wiring, it does save a lot of time. And then auto network connect and dynamic rate shifting. Auto connect, we can set, and, and we can set it up. And I might turn my little tablet on here. It automatically connects here. It allows me to auto connect. Dynamic rate shifting. And if you start scanning and look at the ones outside the building, what data rate are you getting? And this is the all further the further away you get from the access point, the slower it's going to go until you get out of range. If you get a lot of people, yeah, because you've seen the way the packets work. If you get a lot, it depends on what I'll say. That it depends on what they're doing. What's a good way to What's a good way to do a denial of service on an access point now that you've looked at the way it works and the timing and all that other stuff? Keep sending stuff. Well, we watch a movie. <laughs> or download a huge file. Or download a huge file. You're going to keep that thing tied up for a long time, aren't you? So how are you going to do those things? And that goes back to the quality of service issues. Do we want to assign 
certain access points, certain things more prior or higher priority on the wireless than others. That's when we talk about management. We, and you talk about wireless, say, oh, yeah, we do a wireless class. Oh, yeah, I know how to do wireless. I plug it in and connect to it. Well, again, we're not talking about your my house. We're talking about the, the FedEx, the FedEx was a 5,000 square foot uh, distribution facility that they're getting ready to put in here. I saw in the paper this morning, I think, they're going to they're gonna build a distribution facility someplace in the area. The warehouse, are they going to, they're not going to have Ethernet cables hooked to their people going around storing stuff to their packages, are they going to have wireless? So how are we going to manage those things? Can you see that? Huh? That'd be a long wire, yeah. You better not turn the turn the turn the corner wrong. Any of you ever tried to mow a yard with an electric lawnmower? <laughs> it's terrible because you got you got to keep the cord. And I had a neighbor that had one. He talked about the cord dance. Can you imagine trying to do a cord dance with those things? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so. I just put this in because the picture was available. The external antennas, how many are we going to have? The way they're going to look, they're all a little bit different. Wireless access points. They all look a little bit different, I, I think. And, uh, and some of the new ones don't come with external antennas, with removable antennas. Some of the external antennas we found out when we were trying to, uh, and that's the way the, that I read the standard is supposed to say, we got a bunch of link systems around here. They don't have removable antennas on them. Yeah, they don't have removable. And if you read, go back to read the 802.11n, you're not supposed to be able to do that because you're only supposed to be able to have a radiated power of a certain limitation. And what if we put a high gain antenna on it? We just exceeded that power limit. When we put this Yagi on, specialized function, then we're above, because it's got a 20 dBi gain. We go from a 3 dBi, 3 dBi to a 20 dBi, that's a lot more power. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, kind of. But 20 dBi, that's 100 times, right? That's that's the power, that's 10 times twice. So, and the 3 dBi, whatever, 2 point whatever, 3, we'll say 3 for round numbers, is double whatever the uh, intentional radiator produces. This is 100 times the intentional radiator. So why do we do that? We're going to have more focus. That's when we get into passive gain. Go back to some of these terms. Passive gain, focus signal. And it really is designed for some very specific purposes. This one we want to set up a wireless bridge using those access points because that's part of their feature set to be able to do that, just to demonstrate how it works. Bridge generally to connect two wired networks together. The dynamic rate shifting, and this just shows the farther you get away from it, the lower it gets. This has got 11 megabits per second in the center to 5.5 .5 to 2 to 1. Those are the authorized, required, I think is the term, the required data rates. There may be others on the access point, but those are going to be the optional data rates. And some of the questions they ask you about which data rates do they have to have, that's the ones that they have to have in the uh, in the uh, for, for the, this access point, and it's going to be a 1500 byte frame. Uh, so the farther we get away, the slower it's going to be. And you can see that I can see that frequently. I don't go to hotels a whole lot, but in some of the hotels, which access point are 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 I using? Am I using? I had one one time. It didn't matter which access point I used. They had me at one megabit per second, and boy, that was really frustrating. You ever tried to read your email at that? I probably said that before, but even reading your email at one megabit per second just is not going, is not good. More feature sets. Power over Ethernet. Why would we want to do that? So we put it in the ceiling up here so that the students can't, and I told you that story, can't first break the radio and break one of the antennas off just because they could get to it. And then decided that it wasn't working right, so they reset the access point. <laughs> when you reset the access point, what happens to all your configuration? Oh. It's gone. <laughs> so that's an argument for lightweight, as well as put it someplace out of reach. 
How many power connectors do you think are up there? There's at least one because that, that uh, projector's plugged into it, but that's about how many there are, and they had to put that in in order to satisfy the fire marshal because we used to have an extension cord, and he said you can't do that. But that's a way of being able to put devices in odd locations. Power over Ethernet is also a way to put phones next to computers and you don't have to worry about putting another power connector and putting another plug in or being or being able to have some place to plug it in. And if you look at the phones around here, they're all PoE, power over Ethernet. They're powered out of the Ethernet switch. So they just plug into the machine. Or actually they plug into the network and then there's a there's a switch, there's a two port switch in, in the telephones. So the power comes to the telephone and then the computer uses the switch to get its IP address to get it onto the network. If you plug an unpowered device into a powered Ethernet port, no big deal because it checks to be sure what's going on, that it is a powered device before it sends the power to it. Otherwise, we'd have a lot of devices around here that were smoking when we, or someplace that were smoking. Diversity radio antenna, and diversity means that we got more than one of them, and just more than one option is, is the diversity here. Security to limit unauthorized stations access to network resources, and those go back to the 802.1x, the SS, multiple SSIDs, the VLANs, what can we do with these things, more of the feature sets, things we've already talked about. Adjustable transmit power, and this thing has an adjust. Does it, does it have adjustable transmit power, Trevor? He's played with it more than I have. That's why I keep asking. I thought it did. It has. You can turn the power down. Why would you want to do that? You don't want to send your signal to the world. If you can cover your service area with a lower power, you want to do that so that you're not sending the signal farther. Adjustable transmit. The ability to configure parameters, run diagnostics, monitor performance from anywhere on the network using a web browser, and that's just a matter of connecting to it, being able to connect to it, being able to route to it. Support the standards. We wanted to support the standards, and that enormously large <coughs> beacon frame had, and it was enormously large when you get down to it, it had everything in the world in it. Huh? Has what frequency it's on? what protocols it supports, what speeds it supports, goes on and on and on, power, power and all those things. So does it support the standards? <clears throat> and this is just, and again, this is one I probably put in just because I could, ESSID, security, quality, service, VLANs, all part of the feature sets that we want to be able to use. <clears throat> Excuse me. The activities that you're going to do at the end of the chapter, they're all on emulators that D-Link has conveniently provided, conveniently, it's really nice of them to do that. They're using it, obviously, to sell things. It lets you see a lot of this stuff and go in and do the configurations. <clears throat> a couple of things it won't let you do. I thought it would be really be cool to go in there and they show you how to do <coughs> a VLAN with an SSID, <coughs> and you can do everything except do it. When you say to go ahead and do this, it says it's not supported. So you, you'll be able to go through all the processes and then we should be able to do some stuff at the end. Quality of service, I think we talked about that briefly yesterday. Part of the distributed coordination function. These terms just never go away, do they? Distributed coordination function, point coordination function, hybrid coordination function. So this is part of that. Does not work well with real time. Actually, it's not part of the distributed coordination function. It's part of the hybrid coordination function. <clears throat> distributed coordination function doesn't work well for real-time things that need more more of everything. The real-time things that time-dependent traffic, <clears throat> the time-dependent traffic are going to be voice over IP, videos. And if you do one of those, <clears throat> and James did, I'm going to talk here in a little bit, James did, it just gave him a best effort service, so quality of service isn't set up on these things. Quality of service should give voice the highest priority because if you're using wireless voice over IP, see, we just keep making the things longer too, don't we, the terms longer. 
you really want the telephone calls to work, and trust me, if you ever do this, you want the telephone calls to work, because the boss gets a telephone call that gets broken up or chopped up or whatever else, you're going to know about it. The guy who works at Korea says, oh, occasionally they have trouble, they start getting echo in these things, and echo means that we're getting uh, delay, jitter and delay is, is what causes it. Jitter is <clears throat> an inconsistent delay. So you get echo in these things. He said the, the way that they fix it is to reboot the router, <clears throat> and that generally does that. But those things don't work well with the distributed coordination function. That was a hybrid coordination function. And we're going to have four levels of quality of service that you can do these things. That's going to be part of the controls that goes into the packet itself. <clears throat> Prioritize different frames. Increasingly employed with voice over IP. Wi-Fi Multimedia WMM, model after the wild quality of service. It was released by the Wi-Fi Alliance in 2004. <clears throat> and what you find is there's actually two standards. There's the Wi-Fi Alliance standard and there's the IEEE standard. They're similar but not quite exactly the same. <clears throat> the IEEE is released in 2005 and it's based on the hybrid coordination function, the one that, again, we looked at a little bit. Uh, last time, two access mask mechanisms, the enhanced distributed channel access, and no, you don't have to know all these things. Look at the look at the certification homework questions, and again, they should be the same ones that are in the uh, that are in the uh, exam collection banks for the 105 test. It'd be probably a little bit different than the 104 test, but you can't take it anymore. The hybrid coordination channel uses polling along with centralized scheduling the, uh, controlled by the access point. So it does use some polling, but the polling has not been implemented by most of them. <clears throat> Before we start VLANs, after we've gone most of, the, most of the feature set, let's take a break here for a few minutes because I get too long, I know. Okay, let's talk about wireless virtual LANs. Wireless virtual LANs are not really any different than wired virtual LANs, except we're going to associate SSIDs with the VLAN. Go back to routing and all the other things that you may have thought about. Why do we want to use virtual LANs? What's, what, what good are they? Isolation. What it allows us to do is put people on the same network or in different physical locations, right? Big advantage to that. And if you think about wireless and the mobility of wireless, it's even a bigger deal to have the multiple SSIDs. What if you have somebody in the, in the accounting, I'll use accounting because they always talk about accounting, in the accounting VLAN that strolls into the production VLAN or the production SSID. If they connect to the production SSID, then they're going to be on the production network and they're no longer going to be on the accounting network. And that goes back to the multiple SSIDs on the same access point so that we can have multiple VLANs on the same access point. Logical grouping of network devices within a larger physical network. And we can assign on a physical switch, we can assign a port to a VLAN, right? So that we can have people on different networks, virtual though they be different subnets, and when we say networks, when we say VLAN, think subnet. We can have people on different subnets in the same room or even sitting next to each other. So we can put one of you on one and somebody else on the other one. Switch is required for the correct operation. And in order for these things to communicate, you're not going to have a switch, you've got to have a router, right? And you've got to have a router that understands trunking, that understands, I'm going to say the dot one Q protocol will cause even Cisco's converted to that. That's the standard. So the 802.1Q protocol is the trunking protocol that we use with these things. Wireless don't require any additional hardware. The SSIDs can be used to separate users on the network and the APs that support the wireless 
The VLANs may support 16 or more multiple SSIDs. So 16 VLANs actually quite a few. I say that if we were really big, it might not be quite a few, but in our environment, it's quite a few. If we were here, we would need, I don't know, maybe what, three or four, really. If I, if I were doing it, and I'm not, but if I were doing it, I'd put the students on a VLAN, the faculty on a VLAN, and the administrative people on a VLAN. And I'd probably put financial aid on a separate VLAN, isolate them from everybody else. I mean, but can we do that? Can we do that wirelessly? Yeah, is it going to be as secure? No, because who can intercept the wireless signal? Anybody. So it goes back to what are we going to use for security? We can make it, we can make them pretty secure. You got a guy at night said, hey, pretty good at hacking WEP. I've hacked WPA, but I haven't got to WPA2. So how would you get WEP? He said, well, got some rainbow tables to do that with. Actually, he found a site on the internet that once he got the hash, you could submit the rainbow, you could submit it to them, and they use rainbow tables to crack it. So WPA2, fairly, going to be fairly secure in an environment. That goes back to, would we turn the power down if we were, if we were doing them wirelessly, then you turn the power down so that it's not broadcasting, blasting to everybody in the world. So all of those things, different, different combinations of things that you can do to make things better. This is a VLAN, nothing magic here. Uh, on these things, we have, what, uh, one, two, three, and two. The trick to these, trick or whatever, on the trunking port, and I guess that the, actually these, these are the, I'm not close enough, switch one, switch two, switch three. We've got marketing VLAN, resource VLAN, engineering VLAN. They can all be on the different switches and whatever port that's assigned is on that network. I think one of the best explanations, and let's see if I can make this thing work the way that I want it to work, and I probably can't, is that think about VLANs, we'll say the marketing VLAN is the red VLAN. VLANs are the different colors. So what we have is the red VLAN goes into the switch and then it goes into the trunk port. The next switch, if we had, and we'll, we'll say this is marketing, a, a device here that was on the red VLAN, dip down, we didn't really want to go there, uh, <laughs> It would only send it to the machines in the red VLAN. The next VLAN, see we got a different color here, the blue VLAN, we'll say that human resources is in the blue VLAN. It goes out here and all of the colors, all of the VLANs are in the trunk port. That's, that's the advantage and the risk of the trunk port. Because if I could get on that trunk port, I can see all of it, can I? And that's one of the things that can happen to you. That's the native VLAN issue there. The native VLAN is for the untagged frames, but the native VLAN, the way it works is if you get on the native VLAN, you can strip the header for the native VLAN off and see all the different other VLANs. So we have that. So this thing goes down here. Let's say that we have an HR machine down here, so the blue VLAN goes on down. Let's see if I can get it to the right place this time. And it only goes to the HR machine. The red VLAN, we don't have any traffic down here. We can do pruning, so you can turn it off. You can, you can have it not on that switch, so that traffic doesn't even go there. Say again? Isolate it, yeah. So that only the tra only the Ports that are on those VLANs, that only that traffic goes there. And when this comes out, when we, when we do this thing, and that's the intelligence of the switch, the switch allows us to do that, manage switch, so that we can send it only to those ports that are on that particular VLAN. If we had another HR machine here, and it comes in, then the switch would send it to those two and only those two machines because those ports and what we're really managing is the ports. We put the ports on a VLAN. 
that port's on VLAN HR, whatever it is, and they're numbered, obviously, and you can put names on them. These two ports, it goes there, but it doesn't go on the port for the whatever else, engineering or whatever it is in there, so that each of these only goes to where it's supposed to be. In the wireless, this down here, we got SSID guest, and there are two different ways to do this, and let's see if I can do this without corrupting it too much. SSID guest goes to its access point, it's on VLAN 20, it may go to a specific port. We can do it that way. And then we have over here SSID, all the employees are on VLAN 15, and VLAN 15 is on this port. If we were able to put, let me, let me see if I can do this a little better. Let's, let's use some different colors for these guys. It's even got an eraser too. What do you think about that, huh? Employees are on the, again, we're on the, the blue VLAN and the red VLAN. If we, down here, instead of having all these guys as guests and had multiple VLANs on these things, then let's put access point one here. Let's pretend that this is an employee. We'll put a red line there. The employee goes on the red VLAN, goes to and this is a layer three switch. And on a layer three switch, you can configure these things as not on a VLAN, it's just a switch. And then we have virtual interfaces inside it. And it's really tough to make a virtual interface. If you want a virtual interface for VLAN 10, you say INT VLAN 10. And voila, it's there. So interface, VLAN, employee, whatever. Are the employees we already know are on, what, 15? So interface VLAN 15. Now then, let's say down here, and instead of a guest, this is going to be an employee. We'll put a red line under it so that it is on a different SSID. We'll say it's on the red SSID. Red SSID goes up here, and then we have the trunk port. So now the blue and the red VLANs can be on the same port. When it gets inside the layer three switch and we have our virtual interfaces, routing takes place so that the blue and the red can talk to each other. But now we're on the red VLAN. When we get off of here, it only, it only without routing, only sends it onto the red VLAN here because they, they are there. It can't get on the blue VLAN unless it gets routed there. So we can restrict it or not restrict it however we want. And we can do this when we do these things by having multiple VLANs on the same access point and associating the, uh, the uh, SSID with a VLAN. Or you can have everybody connect to a single access point and then that gets connected to a particular port that's assigned to a VLAN. So two different ways to do this thing in order to, to maybe make these things work better. See how it all just goes away? Just magic, isn't it? So I'm going to learn how to use this before it's over with. But different ways to do the VLANs in the wireless world. That's true. <laughs> but I do have to figure out how to get it back into. Okay, now back into mouse mode, I hope. Maybe not into mouse mode. I'm not in mouse mode. two-step process. So this is just another picture does the same thing here. The access point goes into the switch, the accounting VLAN, the marketing VLAN. This is the one that the separation of these things happens on the, he's watching so I'll use this, happens on the access points. 
for these things so that when we get up here, again, the blue and the red, whatever we're going to use, we, uh, we separate them from one to the other. The marketing VLAN, the accounting VLAN. So accounting may be assigned to VLAN, blue VLAN, and I really conceptually colors are probably easier to do with this, I think, than, uh, than our numbers. So the access point will put the accounting VLAN on, the red VLAN, and the marketing VLAN on the blue VLAN, and then you assi can assign numbers to those things. So, going the wrong direction here. Advantages and limitations, we talk about roaming, layer two roaming, and this is the chart in the book, layer two, layer three, management, adjusted configuration, load balancing, all the things that we can do with the autonomous access points. Advantages, quality of service, wireless VLANs, other options, scalability is straightforward and unlimited, depending on how many of these things that we're going to have, but you may have to do a number of things with them. Controller based rely on the wireless LAN controller, WLC, and that's the way you'll see these things uh, referred to. The heart of the network. Centrally configured, the settings can be automatically distributed to all access points, so that if we've got a hundred of them, we can configure the wireless LAN controller and send those configurations to the lightweight access points. And again, the thing that always is kind of I guess surprised me a little bit is that upgrading an access point, you upgrade an autonomous access point to a lightweight access point. So you take all the intelligence out of it, and that's better. Controller based are different from the APs using the autonomous access point. Some of them you can, Cisco's you can, you can, in many of them, I'll say in all of them, many of them get an iOS, upgrade it from an autonomous to a lightweight. This is just a picture that's got a little bit of everything. The w, w LAN controller. What this has in here is the Cisco wireless LAN controller. Let's use, let's use blue here and see if I can get out of it. So we have the wireless LAN controller here, which is going to control the configuration. And it shows up here with the router. You can get wireless LAN controller modules to go on routers back to the modularity of Cisco. So you can get those, and then when something changes, it sends the information to the access point so that they're updated simultaneously. The other disadvantage of the autonomous access points is if we were doing them one at a time, some of them are going to have one configuration and some of them are going to have another configuration until you get them all done. In this case, you can get them all done at the same time. So this is just a, this is just a figure that's got a lot of different things on it, but it's, it's supposed to demonstrate the uh, the WLAN controllers. Now that the mouse is working, maybe. Kind of. Lightweight mesh captive portal. And I, the activity I have you to look at captive portal. What captive portal does is this is the kind of thing you go to the hotel where you got to put in a username or password or agree to the uh, conditions of service, those kinds of things. So the lightweight access points. Mesh access points and captive portal access points are the major types of controller-based 
AP. So lightweight, we've talked about, it's got a LAN controller that sends the information to the other devices. Doesn't contain any of the management configurations. I only have simplified radios for wireless communications. And the media converter for accessing the wired network. The media converter going to go from wireless to wired. Split MAC division in which the lightweight APs only handle the real-time functions while the MAC functionality is processed by the WLC. So when you see the term split MAC, this is what we're talking about uh, in these things. The benefit, decrease the total cost of ownership because you don't have to spend as much on the uh, maintenance of these things. What I wanted to try to do Go back to this one, which says that the media converter, the, the real-time functions, the layer functions in the Mac. What does that mean? What does what? And what I want to do is try this thing again. Try this board. What does each of these do? And I tried to make a list of what functionality goes on in each of these things. So let's go over here to the, the WLC, the wireless LAN controller. And these are all obviously going to be 802.11 whatevers. It does authentication. Association. Association, frame translation, eight hundred two dot one X, and it terminates the eight hundred two dot one X, and it usually is going to tunnel the packets from one to the other. The data packets are the ones that are that it, that it handles, and it does a handoff. For roaming. That means that the authentication and the association are significant because in the access points before we went to centralized management, if we did roaming, there had to be a handoff procedure. And the handoff procedure was generally proprietary. This is generally going to be proprietary too, but in it, if we are roaming since we've authenticated and the authentication takes place through the wireless line controller and the association, it's a smoother transition from one location to the other. So what does the access point do? What are the real-time stuff that we're talking about? About the handshake with the client. So the handshake with the client, beacons, it's going to send the beacons. Beacon, uh, buffer the power save. Probe response, yes, monitor the radio characteristics, radio characteristics. Because that's going to be a simple matter of signal strength. Actually, what usually makes that decision is going to be the uh, going to be the client machine because it's, it can't it can't get there. It's going to be uh, it's going to be doing it, it. The access point is going to be transmitting at maximum power. Monitor the presence of other APs. So 
it could actually be used and they can be configured to look for rogue access points and does encryption and decryption. So what does what? So the access point, the real-time stuff, the wireless LAN controller, the non-real-time stuff, associate, authenticate, transfer, 80211, the handoffs, and in a large roaming environment, that can be kind of significant. Do you have to have a handoff procedure? And no, you really don't for those things. What does each of them do? The reason I want to go through those is that's another thing that if you take the CERT test, I think you're going to have to be able to to know what does what in, in the uh, area. There you go. So a mesh architecture. This shows, and we, we always say, consistently say, you have to have one. You have to have at least one. This, this just shows two. That's just because it's got some backup. It's got an in Internet router on each end. If one of them goes down, then it can go to the other one. You really don't have to have two. But in, these, in this picture here, the access points are talking to each other using the wireless. And again, typically, they're going to communicate with each other with a 5 gigahertz radio and communicate with the clients with the 2.4 gigahertz radio. Lightweight mesh communicates with the next closest mesh point. Does, doesn't have to be connected. Only one, only one has to be connected there, which you can have other ones. Centrally controlled and managed by the wireless LAN controller. And this is, the, this is a projection of labor costs with autonomous access points and with lightweight access points. The, uh, I'm going to try it again. The autonomous access points, and what's going to happen with labor costs over the cost over the course of time? They're going to go up or down. They're going to continue to increase. Or we hope they're going to continue to increase. That means we're getting pay raises. What's the biggest cost to industry? Hmm? Overhead. Overhead. Well, yeah, okay. What's the biggest single factor in overhead? How about labor? Labor, right? So if you can decrease the labor cost, which is what they're all, what we're all trying to do, what all the industry is trying to do, in, then you got a pretty substantial cost savings here by putting in the, uh, the mesh access points or the lightweight access points. Uh, the initial cost, you notice, is relatively high, the labor cost. And you've got to also consider in the cost of material because they, they don't give away the wireless LAN controllers. You look up the prices. I looked up a Cisco line. I didn't look out a whole lot of them. It was a little over $10,000. Uh, so, the, and the access points that will work with these things are going to be a little bit different, too. I forgot to erase it. In there. So, some other things. Captive portal. Talk about, you've probably all seen this. Go to a hotel. And at one time here, when you try to get on the Internet, you had to put in credentials, put in some sort of credential. And all this picture here is showing is the customer goes to the access point, and until you actually get authenticated, you get redirected to some place to put it in. Most hotels use just the name and 
Yeah, that, yeah. It didn't. You're right, but it didn't used to be that way. And I think because if you go back, think about the antennas that we talked about, the the long narrow ones that you mounted in the hall, and had a relatively narrow beam width, that they're not beaming their signal to the world in omnidirectional antennas now anymore. They can confine it, so they're not so worried about people driving into the parking lot and getting onto the. Yeah, no, yeah, worry about James driving in the parking lot and getting his directions with his phone. That's right. Uh, so I, I'm, I don't know that maybe the antennas have helped that, that they're not as scared. I agree with you. I hadn't been to a hotel and it's like, oh, what's the wireless? Oh, so just get on. So, yeah, those things change and, and this is still something that you may want to do, particularly in a corporate world, isn't it? because you're not really looking at making things as free as possible. So the captive portal uses a standard browser, typically use public WLANs, uh, user required to read, and this is the one that you may want users to do, even if you just put in your room number is to, I, by clicking I accept, just like you guys do here, by logging on I accept all of the conditions of this network, and and if you've ever read that thing, and if I and if I don't, you can send me to jail. Never, you've never read that big disclaimer, have you? Yeah, that's the fine print at the bottom. Same thing here. Acceptable use policy, and you probably have a link say, "Here's what our acceptable use policy is." So that, well, what they don't want to do is get arrested for somebody doing, and they always the example child pornography or. RIAA get get after you downloading stuff because who's going to get in trouble? It's going to be them because that's about as far as they can track that stuff to. Isn't it? Captive portal is not a required part of the controller based architecture uh, architecture, which is found very often. And this is just another picture of the captive portable portal. I accept or decline, and again the. Uh, User act or acceptable use policy probably one of the things that you that you want to be able to do here. Put this one up because it, it they the WLAN controller can be at any of the different areas of the network. And I put these up. This is goes back to Cisco. This is Cisco's core distribution and access. You don't have to have all three of these and and. Uh, WLAN controller can be at any of those. Our WLAN controller as such that we use here is actually cloud managed. So it's going to be up at, at and they, they use it for all of the, uh, all the campuses. The distribution layer in our environment, we'll start at the access layer. Access layer is in this room. Access layer, the switches in this room. The distribution layer, the routers and the NOC. And if we were going to have a core layer, it would be traffic between this campus and other campuses where you have a backbone that connects things together. So you can put this WLAN controller at any of those locations. WLC, uh, similar to a wired network, sometimes called a wireless switch, enhanced features, the core layer, backbone, distribution layer, working group layer, or access layer. And all I'm saying is you can, you can manage them at any at any layer. And if you get too many, then you've got to have a management mechanism to manage your managers. And those are available also. It just keeps going up through these things. More pictures of where you're going to put these things at. Automated tools to help predict, and this is one of the things, the best locations. It can help you locate your uh, access point, predict where the best location for them are. WLAN profiles uh, for specific configurations, uh, multiple BSSIDs, multiple BSSIDs. This is different than SSIDs. Remember, the BSSID is the is the MAC address for simplifying. What they do here is, if we use a single channel architecture, then it basically lies to everybody and says that all of the access points have the same. BSSID, the same MAC address, so that you don't really say, oh, i got to change from one to the other. 
so it can do that. Client roaming, because it, the LAN controller, does the authentication and the association, then you already have done that. You don't have to go through a handoff procedure. It's all managed through the WLAN controller. Disadvantage is there's the propri proprietary is the big disadvantage. CAPWAP is a working group that's trying to uh, standardize this thing so that you could take a Cisco WLAN controller and put a D-Link or, or whatever other else lightweight access point into it. You can't do that now. If you buy a Cisco, you're going to be a Cisco. If you do a D-Link, you're going to be a D-Link. Other architectures, <clears throat> arrays, cooperative control, and mesh networks. Mesh we've already kind of talked about. An array contains 16 integrated access points. So it's got a bunch of access points integrated in a single antenna. Uh, these things here, the channels are physically adjacent and all those. What it looks like is something like this. And what you have is inside a single antenna, and it's just a little gray box, a whole bunch of individual radios that ha that are all on different channels. And this is what one looks like. This is the Xirus, and it's X-I-R-R-U-S. And your book says they're the only ones that actually sell this thing. So if you get, if you want to get see more about it, you can go look on them. The cooperative control is going to be hives. Each AP contains the cap capabilities of a WLAN controller. And it's just co cooperative in, in these things. Multiple hives can be in organizational groups, special control for autonomous access points. And this is from Air, Aero, Aeronet. I think it's Aeronet are the ones that produce this piece of hardware. So some of these things we're getting into, yeah, they're proprietary. Only one person makes them. Only one person, only one company may, may be making it. They they got to have APs, the wire connection, the wireless connection, the hives, cooperative share information with each other. It's kind of like multitasking. We used to have uh, cooperative multitasking, which depended upon the application to take care of itself. Cloud management updates can be applied. Cloud management just means that we're managing this thing from the internet, and that that's what it really does mean. In it that we're using the internet to manage it. Hours and again, those hours are managed by via the cloud cloud management just just through the internet. The cloud hosted service connects to all these things, and hopefully none of that's mystical anymore because that just means that you can connect to it. It's got an IP address. They really can control the temperature in the building from the internet. You can't control it from the thermostat, but you can control it from the internet. And that's so that they can have some standardization, so that people can't make them really hot or really cold. There's like a four degree range around whatever they, whatever Chris sets in the central controller that allows you to change the temperature slightly within the room itself. Mesh networks, wireless mesh networks, we talked about all of them, talking to the other ones. And a wireless mesh is a good deal because it, it is something that is Expandable quickly, same picture. The the access points talk to each other. If we needed more coverage, we would just put another wireless mesh access point in it. And it's got a gateway router, same one that shows two different two different ones of these things. The single channel architecture, multi channel architecture, kind of have mentioned a little bit already. Each has its own advantage and disadvantage. Multi-channel, co-channel interference reduces the throughput. That's what we worry about, the 1, 6, and 11. Don't have that big a worry with the 802.11a because you have the bandwidth available to the channels. 5 megahertz on each of the channels on the 802.11b, and we need a 22 megahertz bandwidth in order to actually send the information. Micro-channel micro architecture, small areas of coverage, and what we're talking about here, they're talking about hexagonal tilting. Channel reuse is required for the multi-channel architecture, and you notice that you alternate channels, and that's really what you're talking about. Don't put them adjacent to each other and have the five channel separation so you're using one, six, and, one, six, and 11. The hexagonal 
so that it allows for a little bit of the overlap. The hexagonal translates to the one over here. You are going to have some overlap of these channels. That's why you don't want to do that. Single channel, each of them is on the same channel. So the advantage of a smoother handoff, easy setup, co-channel interference is no longer an issue because you're accepting that you have it. Uh, you do still have the interference, but the signal strength is strong enough that it overcomes the interference. And that, you see that happening all here, here all the time. If you go up to the front of the building, there's a whole bunch, or just step outside, there's a whole bunch of access points out there. Some of them are on interfering channels. They don't really interfere with us because the signal strength is not strong enough. This is what those would look like. And what this is kind of showing, to me at least, is that if you had a multi-story building, you might want to put each floor on the, on a channel. The other thing on the multi-channel that you have to consider in a multi-floor environment is what channels directly above. Are you interfering above and below? Because remember, these things are omnidirectional, omni, not just in the horizontal, but also in the vertical plane. So they can interfere up and down as well as horizontally. Dense wind deployments, channel spanning, channel blankets, channel stacking are the terms that you'll hear for uh, the uh, single channel architecture. Network management systems, so configuration management, deployment, and troubleshooting. What we're really talking about here, what wireless network management systems, we're talk, kind of talking about the wireless network controller, except it's on a larger scale. Firmware, software distribution, network, not just local area networks. WLAN controllers, this manages a larger scale of the network. Uh, intelligence scheduling updates, things like that, that we're managing the entire network. And if we were in Cisco, we would talk about unified management. Power management, we've looked at that, seen that a little bit, talked about that. We want to put them to sleep as much as possible, turn off the radios, and <clears throat> look at the layer two packets. There is a uh, feature in there that the access point, the access point, the client can tell the access point that it's going to sleep, the access point then caches any information that's for it and sends it. There's special packets that get sent if there's multicast or broadcast traffic for the access, for the clients and they may send those and then they'll wake up, accept those and then go back to sleep. Allows the multiple devices to conserve the battery life Station sends a frame to the AP, and again, you should see those. The AP sends, the AP receives the frames and temporarily stores and buffers the frames until the access point sends another packet that says, hey, I'm awake now, send me my traffic. And occasionally they will wake up. The frame contains a list of stations that have buffered information waiting for them, traffic indication map, so more of the management frames, more management frames, traffic indi indication map, which access points, and you're not going to see that here because we don't, we, ours don't buffer. But you would have that in one of these larger systems that this is a list. If you're on the list, I'll send me my information, then you get taken off of the list. It's just, just telling everything what's there. Basic, a station learned to determine that buffered frames are waiting for it. The station will request the AP to have those frames forward, and once that happens, doesn't have anything, and then it can go back to sleep. It goes back into power save mode. Delivery, delivery traffic indication message in power save mode must receive a frame intended for all stations. A broadcast is going to receive one of these. And this is just a picture of send the frames, send frames request and then it sends the information back to Tim, are you on the list of stations that have things that are going on? And the basic power management ad hoc, time at which the stations must be awake, devices previously attempted to send the frame to the sleeping stations, and all these are just messages, the station's asleep, can it go to sleep, how long is it asleep, when does it get its traffic? Ad hoc becomes a different situation because there's no access point to manage these things. Unscheduled, and I think this is the last thing, unscheduled automatic 
power delivery, which whenever the AP sees a frame coming from the station, it will immediately release. It doesn't have to wait for the uh, for the uh, regularly scheduled broadcast. That it automatically gets the information using it. Power poles and scheduled poles. Oh no, one more. Spatial multiplexing. Spatial just means that there's more of them. What this says is, in a MIMO, if you've got three radios and you're in a reduced state, spatial multiplexing, you should shut down two of the radios and only have one of them transmitting, one of them operating. So, and if you need to, the traffic, you can turn the other radios on. So spatial multiplexing is just turning off radios. And now we are at the last one. I know you really thought it would never get there today, didn't you? Architectures, what's the most common? Or do we have to start over? You don't want to do that. What's the most common type of access point? Autonomous. Autonomous. And then the, the basic network. And then we have the extended network. We have some things with QO quality of service, LANs and VLANs, wireless VLANs. We talked about those. The types of controllers, lightweight mesh, captive portal things, the wireless LAN controller, centralized management, and then we had a network management that went one step above the uh, wireless LAN controller. Wireless LAN controller is basically a smart switch or a module that goes into a router. Network access controller does a little more because it talks about sending updates and, and mani managing the network, not just these things. Channel architecture, multi-channel or single channel, uh, different things there. The, the wireless network management system, power management. And power management can be, be a big deal if, you, if you're having battery problems. And I think most, although they got a lot better with the, with the lightweight uh, laptops, which cost a lot more, but batteries last a lot longer. I bought a... Uh, Five-hour battery, I think, one time. Those things weigh a lot. And that's one of the things you, you got to look at, I believe. And, and in tablets, it's a big deal because you don't want them to, to weigh a whole lot. You don't set them on your lap like you do a laptop. You hold them. And the, the, the heavier they are, you get arm fatigue if you're trying to use them, trying to read on them. And that's what a lot of people are doing with those things. Two categories, the basic and the enhanced. All the enhanced does is say you don't have to wait for everything to get sent there. Questions? No questions. I know, it's time for a nap now, right? Okay, you've got activities to do. The activities are mostly on a website. And there's a link at the top of uh, this week that takes you directly there. You don't have to go through his... his uh, his addresses, which go forever and didn't work for me. So I found them. There is a link there that should take you. And there's two different emulators that you'll use. There's a link for each of them that's at the top of the page under the resources. 